Hi, everyone. I'm Rick Benson. You are. And welcome to this week's In the No Trader show. Well, as we record late Tuesday morning, the S&P is now down over 40 points. Again, the market is coming off over coronavirus issues that continually seem to be spreading. And investors are not taking the news well. And we're going to take a look at all that today. In fact, um, well, here, let me get you to um, just contact information, and then we'll walk through what we're going to do today. Best way to get me by email, rick at inthenotrader.com. And uh, thank you for the continued nice comments that I get every week after these shows. Uh, really appreciate them. And of course, inthenotrader.com, our website, uh, where you can find out how to become a client. Uh, we have a weekly newsletter that goes out every Wednesday night and uh, also a bunch of videos and things are there too. So that's in the no trader.com. This week, we'll take a look at the S and P sector uh, relative performance. Like we do most weeks, we'll take a look at the S and P itself because markets are really moving now. And then I thought what it would do is really dedicate the rest of the show and looking at some of the bigger markets across the globe. Um, so TNX is, of course, the U.S. 10-year. Uh, that's the actual interest rate. The tradable ETF is IEF. That's the one that most closely tracks the 10-year. It's actually the Lehman 7 to 10-year index that it's based upon, but that is by far has the closest correlation to how the U.S. 10-year trades than anything else. GLD is gold. USO oil. Uh, DXY is the dollar uh, index. Fez is the uh, Europe 50, uh, the Euro 50 stock index ETF. So that's similar to like the Dow in the US. It's the top 50 stocks in Europe. EWG is Germany's. Um, it's not quite the DAX index, but it is what is tracked again by ETFs. So that is the most popular ETF tracking the largest economy in Europe. Uh, EEM is, of course, the largest emerging market ETF. EWJ is Japan and FXI is China. So we'll kind of get a good global perspective um, of some of the major markets, what they're doing and how to play them going forward. Uh, and, and, and I think uh, very importantly, what's, what goes on in the next couple of months is going to be very important for the markets. Um, for those of you who have been following me for some time, you know that I have been concerned about coronavirus in a much bigger way than both the market was um, and um, what um, people have been saying about it and how easy it'll be to get past it. I never agreed with that. I did uh, mildly add some new long exposure when the S&P made new highs a few weeks ago, but uh, we'll talk about when we actually get into the S&P chart, we'll talk about uh, why I am as bearish as I am at this point. Um, so let's first take a look here on a week over week comparison of how the 11 S&P sectors have done as of last night's close. So it does not include uh, today's price action. So year to date through um, last night's close relative to the S&P. Again, these are relative performance, each one of the sectors on the bottom. Um, and then where they stood a week ago, so we can see over the last week what has changed. And only one sector of the 11 is actually in a worse off shape. Uh, that is technology. As of last night's close, tech was beating the S&P uh, by 4.14%. A week ago, it was by over 6%. So we highlight anything that's moved over 1% in the week in relative terms. Notice how many green dots we've had. Uh, we, we now have this week, this one of the larger uh, weekly changes in relative performance for uh, outperformers. Five different sectors um, really picked up uh, gains last week versus the S&P materials, and that a lot of it had to do with just gold uh, dragging uh, the material sector higher, uh, that at least until today's reversal. But again, uh, in a general sense, materials picked up a couple of hundred basis points of performance. 
Um, what else do we see? Staples went from being down on the year to up, and that, of course, is a defensive move. So they picked up um, about 2.5% or so uh, of relative performance. Healthcare went from almost minus 3 to about minus 1.5, so that's done better. Utilities, also a defensive play, are now outperforming by 7.7% instead of about 5% from last week. So that picked up. Um, a good chunk. And then uh, REITs were up 3.4% uh, as of last week. And then as of last night's close, up 7%. So they picked up a significant amount. And now you see that both utilities and real estate are the two leading sectors this year where technology has fallen into third place. On the downside, energy still remains the dog as it was last year. Um, it, has, it has not been able to gain any traction on the sell-off, and uh, materials remain the second worst uh, performer year-to-date. So, that's, uh, so you know, we're, we're seeing a shift towards, um, obviously, utilities and real estate. When interest rates go down, those tend to outperform, and uh, we've seen a decent, uh, I won't call it a full collapse, but, but certainly... Tech has uh, took it on the chin this past week, and uh, that's not a surprise either, given what the market's done and and how good uh, mega cap tech has led the market and how quickly the balloon can lose its air when things go astray. All righty, let's take a look at, uh, that's not what I want to take a look at. Here we go. Let's start with charts. So here's the uh, S&P 500 in real time. So currently trading 31.83 as we record this. Um, so yesterday's big gap down broke the minor uptrend line from the middle of October. Certainly if I'd taken the low from October and here, even if I, it, it broke it also. Um, so that trend line is broken. It doesn't mean the trend is broken and people uh, often get confused about it. Um, but generally, um, I'll actually say, if we're looking here at a daily chart in the shorter term, even the trend is broken because if an uptrend is a combination of higher highs and higher lows, um, we, we actually today clearly took out the late January low. So now, as of today's price action, you can say the trend has changed to, at least on a short-term basis, the uptrend is gone, and we've traded lower than the last low of significance in this time frame. Therefore, uh, we've changed it. You actually can't even draw a trend line um, downward yet because the angle is very steep, as well as the, not, a, not on a daily chart. You can, if you start cutting this down to a three-minute chart, or some type of intraday basis, but uh, I'll I'll tell you something that uh, you know, kind of the way I look at things too, and and this is more a little educational than anything else. But here, so if the highest high, um, you know, you're always going to want to see a defined high by having a day whose bar has lower highs on either side of it, right? You want the high to be high because the day after and the day before it had lower highs. So if that's the high, in order to draw a downtrend line, you have to be able to draw it to another day whose high is surrounded by lower highs on either side. Right now, you can't do that. Every high is a lower high, and until we get some type of bounce that puts in a high that's above the high from the day before it and the day after it, you really can't draw a proper trend line in this time frame, again, if I cut it down to a five minute chart, a 30 minute chart, I'd easily be able to draw a trend line off the high. It'll still be pretty steep, but um, you'd be able to do it on a daily chart. You cannot properly draw a trend line off of this high yet. Secondly, of importance, look where we're trading now. The propulsion full exhaustion level, that's this triangle, these orange triangles. So right here at 3188-ish or so, there is theoretical support. Uh, it also happens to be the bottom of the daily cloud. So even though intraday we've traded beneath this and the day is still only, not, we're not even two hours into the day and we certainly could sell off more, 
I do know that there should be some support at this level. So it'll be interesting to see how we close today relative to this 3188 level. It's two unrelated uh, levels on the chart that happen to be at the same place. Thirdly, in the Tom DeMarc world of uh, models, when we have what we think is an important high, which now this certainly looks like the, the high from last week is, um, we can start laying out something called trend factors. And DeMarc trend factors are something Tom had noticed years ago that markets often move in increments of 5.56%, uh, both going up and from the highs. Uh, so if this is an important high, the first level down is gonna be 5.56% from the close of the day we make the high. All other levels down are gonna be 5.56% uh, increments off of the actual high itself. So the first one would be 94.44%, the second one would be 89. Point, I don't remember what it is, but that would be down here. So again, in this realm of where there's possibly support, there's also a level here at 31.98. First target down really from those highs is into this area. I've got one, two, and then three at the bottom of the cloud, three unrelated measurements that all kind of come um, into this level that's roughly, we'll say 3185 to 3200. So we'll see if we get any type bounce here today or whether or not just we're gonna keep falling. If we do, um, we could estimate that with it, unless we get a 5.56% bounce from a low, then if we break this materially, the next level now would be here at 3,026. And depending upon how much time it takes to get there, that certainly, if it takes a couple of weeks to get there, we'll be right around the uptrend line from, let's take a look where this started from. So the lower of these purple lines, that comes, I'm guessing, could even be from the Christmas low. Let's see. No, it's from last summer's low. All right, so that would be another potential target area, a little north of 3,000. So that's what I'm seeing from the daily chart. Also notice the uh, negative divergence that we saw when the high was made. Price made a higher high to what is now all-time highs. The MACD made a lower high and got a crossover, and we've taken out the prior low. So that is a negative divergence and uh, another reason why the highs that are in place now at 33.94 will likely stay the high for some time. Now, let's switch to the weekly chart. And the weekly chart, we've shown you this for the last few weeks, has an upside sequential, again, a Tom DeMarc model, an upside, uh, this is actually an aggressive uh, combo. So a sister model of sequential is combo, it counts to 13s also, it just has a different way of counting the 13s. It seems to be fairly well in sync with the S&P of the past because you can see an upside exhaustion signal here in the summer of 2018. That was obviously a very good call. Uh, another signal showed up in May of last year, and then we had the summer decline. And once again, we had a 13 show up about a little over a month ago. Um, it's risk level. In other words, where the signal would be wrong for saying that you have upside exhaustion is at, look at what that level is, 3394.01. And you'd have to get a proper Friday close above there, followed by a Monday morning open also above there to stop this out. Uh, so for instance, this horizontal purple line here was the stop out level to this 13. It actually never got stopped out properly, um, even though we would have traded through, you know, once we got through a propulsion level, we certainly wouldn't have been leaning negative anymore. Uh, but this is telling us it's still dotted. It never got closed above properly. The all-time high is uh, 33.93.52, so half an S&P point from this level, and now we've fallen like a rock. Uh, so it's uh, looking at a weekly chart. The next level down here is also that same trend line, except this one, uh, it's actually not the same. This goes to the Christmas low from 2018, a channel line, and, this week and probably next week 
it happens to be uh, right around 3125, which is also where the baseline from the cloud model shows up. So 3125 is kind of an important near-term level down to 3092, the exhaustion, uh, the propulsion exhaustion level on a weekly chart. So I like to look for clusters of where I have unrelated models showing up with same type target levels to, to think that that's where things can go. Most importantly, at looking at this, we had the idea, it's why we took down in January, actually starting very late December, uh, for in the know trader clients, we started taking down risk quite a bit because of this 13. Uh, we put a little bit back on just as we made new highs, but nothing uh, really big. And in fact, for those of you who are in the no trader clients, you know that over the last few weeks, we put on a fair amount of gold exposure through gold equities and have at least done decently there until you know today. Obviously, gold has done a turnaround and they're seeing some pressure there, but they've been nice winners. So we've taken down probably what was as many as I would guess 10 positions. Uh, to less than half of that, or maybe half of that after last week adding the gold and stuff. So um, this is of a concern, clearly just having nothing to do with coronavirus, it's just the way the market works and the way you know, the models we look at work. Um, but now let's also put into the mixture my thoughts about coronavirus, which as I said, when I started the show, I've always had more concern about this uh, right from the get-go than others do. I am not a doomsdayer at all, um, but I did think from what I read and from some very good sourced information that I have, um, I have a contact who's very well connected to the U.S. medical community uh, and has given me constant updates on um, our medical community's preparation and thoughts about coronavirus, etc. cetera. Um, he's been spot on. He and, and the information I get continues to have me be quite cautious. Um, there, according to what he tells me, there's a good chance that this will reach kind of a global pandemic stage by the summer. In other words, the bulk of the world will have had exposure to the virus and many people will have the virus. Uh, it doesn't mean there will be many, many deaths because of the virus, but the virus itself will spread uh, on a global basis uh, by the summer. The other thing he mentioned to me is that uh, he has heard that as early as today, possibly, uh, the, um, through the Trump administration, there may be an announcement of a coronavirus czar being named here in the US. I'm not sure um, what that does, but um, that's what I'm hearing, and of course, you also have to think about the fact that um, there's very little discussion. And I generally, again, keep politics out of my writings, out of you know what I talk about, but there is some stuff being bantered about now that two years ago, President Trump um, fired everybody in the infectious disease area of the government who are researchers and doctors, et cetera, and never replaced them. Um, so now it, it, it's, it's actually, you know, a potential problem and that, that needs to get fixed quickly as um, greater chances are that this will hit our shores sooner or later. Um, and as, as I've written, it's not a matter of if this is going to happen in the U.S., it's only a matter of when and then, of course, what the reactions are and how prepared we are to deal with it. So, um, this morning's headlines have this uh, now in, where did I hear, Croatia, and uh, there was in uh, Switzerland got its first case today. Um, so yeah, this, look, this, it's a virus, you know, and in, to many people, if you get it, it won't be, and it shouldn't be worse than any cold. But certainly there's, uh, I, I think the statistic right now is somewhere around a little over three, three and a half percent of people who got it have died from it. So, you know, it's something that we all need to be concerned about. And uh, from a, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not here. Can I give medical advice? What I hear is, you know, wash your hands constantly um, and wash them for a good 30 seconds, uh, which is longer than most people do too. And if you feel your hands starting to dry out, use some, you know, moisturizer or something. So keep your hands clean um, and do not touch your face. Those are the two worst, you know, un unclean hands and touching your face with dirty hands are the two worst things you can do. So. 
uh, that's that's what I read here and can at least pass on. And hopefully, any of you listening to this know that already. Okay, so you you get the idea that I think the market's going lower. And when I look at the weekly chart, if this continues downward, um, and kind of in a bad way, where where could we go? So if we break under roughly uh, the 3100 level, then you open the door to come all the way down to the top of the weekly cloud um, as potentially being the support level. And the longer it takes to get down there, the higher the support level is. So if it took all the way into June, um, you know, at, at some point in June, late June, you're at the same 3100 level that uh, this propulsion exhaustion, full exhaustion target is right now. If it happens more quickly, you could get down all the way to about 2,900 or so. And it doesn't have to stop at the top of the cloud, but given how bullish the market's been over time, I would tend to think that this area near 2,900 probably uh, would be of significance. And for those of you who are long-term bulls, as I am, um, I would probably uh, be a buyer there for you know whatever cash I have on the sidelines waiting to get in to the market uh, is would I would I would put some to work there probably some more down at uh, 2800 if got there and if we got to the bottom of the cloud there too um, you know right now there's no reason to think that what happened all the way back in 2018 when we had that severe sell off into the Christmas bottom would come into play so you know in bigger terms i would think 2900 to roughly 2700 um anytime in the next month if you had a real plunking in the market is is where i would do a significant amount of buying and for the time being um i would tell you that i do not see new highs coming um it's not not without uh, another significant you know or continued sell-offs along the way so therefore i i think that i would want to be a seller if you're looking to lighten up some exposure uh, use rallies to lighten up in fact if i go back to the daily chart here and then we'll for the remainder of time we'll look at some of the other markets so if we do end up holding in here look for the top of the cloud and some of the levels of the cloud model to, to create resistance over the next several weeks if we got a bounce. So if we do hold in here and some good news came out, all of a sudden you find yourself trading near 32.75, anything in that area, I'm a happy seller because uh, I don't think these highs near 3,400 are gonna be taken out without more significant decline. Okay, let's move to the TNX. Here's a weekly chart of US 10 year rates. Hold on, it's missing the current week. It'll populate in a second, hopefully. Come on. Uh, come on, we're trading down here. Oh no, actually this is right, 133. Okay, so in, remember in TNX um, takes the, it's 10 times the actual interest rate. So when you see 13.34, that's a 1.33% yield. Um, we talked today, you can notice if I'll blow this up a bit. You can see the bottom of the candle wick. We actually made new all-time lows today in the TNX. Um, there is some longer-term support here. Uh, given the count on the weekly being at a seven towards a nine, my guess is we could get down to 125 to 121 or so over the next couple of weeks. Um, so interest rates are making new lows, not good for savers, good for mortgage buyers, um, and potentially good for businesses over time. But um, that will, you know, it's certainly not good for banks. And uh, banks as investments uh, do not do well with a low interest rate environment. The IEF, uh, let me switch this window and just pick something. Uh, here, let's take an old Apple chart. So IEF, that's the 10-year uh, ETF. Notice it does have a little bit, uh, it has a signal here for exhaustion. It would not be significant, probably, unless we did what's called a negative price flip, a close less than the close from four days prior. So right now, all it tells me is I probably don't want to be a buyer uh, of IEF right here. I, you know, if I'm going to be a buyer, I'm going to be a buyer and a pullback. There's also uh, a longstanding propulsion target here at um, 115 and change, and that's where we're trading now. So um even though we're on new highs i'm not a buyer up here but i i probably would be a buyer on a pullback 
um, GLD. Let's switch to a weekly chart. Okay, so gold, and let me also put up aggressive sequential. Okay, so gold broke out recently, uh, got to its best level in seven years. We're looking at GLD here. It does not directly relate to the price of gold. Gold right now um, is, let me see, t -t 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 April gold uh, on COMEX is at 1651 as we speak. So the, the price here of 155 doesn't relate to it. Uh, but you can see that on the weekly chart here, we have you know some rejection this week. In gold itself got to, uh, I think it was 1694 yesterday or 1691, something close to what's been a longstanding target of ours of 1700. It's a measured move off of the whole bottoming in gold that took place for six years. Um, and funds are mega, mega long gold. They are long uh, eight contracts for every one short. So um, I think gold is gonna actually have a little bit of a hard time up here with with that type proportion um but um in in bigger terms gold you know i'd buy pullbacks in gold i just right right here right now i think it needs to settle in a little bit uso is the oil market and uh don't need the cloud chart for this right now so um this would say in using uso which tracks the front month futures um 10.28 is some theoretical support but if it breaks there um and you get into a really bad situation with global growth and things like that the next bigger downside target would be uh, 6.7 which probably equates to oil in the mid 30s or something like that um from from the current uh, 51 dollars or so that it's trading today the dollar index So this is a weekly chart. It's been moving up all year. Again, confounding most strategists had um, the dollar falling this year and it's been moving straight up. It did get a, sequ a weekly sequential signal and you can see there are lots of them um, in the last year and a half and almost all of them were very good signals for when not to be a buyer in an uptrend. So the 13 in here, you go months sideways. Um, you get a 13 combination up in here, you get a decline. You got a 13 here, you got a decline. You got 13 here, you get a decline. And sure enough, you got it again. So this is very good for trading and you know feeding dollar moves. But look at here. It's probably not a precise channel, but if I put up a channel, uh, I don't know, something like you know this and this. Um, you're, the, the dollar is, you know, longer term, still edging higher, but you can clearly time um, when to fade the moves just based upon this, and you get a couple weeks of, of a pullback in the dollar. Um, here in 2017, the dollar got over 103, and uh, I can't make that call yet that that's, you know, where we're going. We're still in an active propulsion up move that would uh, target uh, 102 and change. Uh, but I, I suspect this, you know, you, should, you use daily chart, you want to be a buyer on um, some pullbacks here. Let's quickly, uh, we're running out of time. Sorry, I went long on some other things. Let's look at China, FXI. Nothing of particular note here, you know, middle of the range, so nothing to do there. Here's Germany falling off from recently. Could be some minor support here. Bigger support down here against, you know, those... 2018 lows, I don't know if we'll get there. So minor support 27 uh, ish, and then 24 and a half. Uh, EEM, a lot of people have that, including myself. That's been a long term hold of mine. And, you know, look, emerging markets the last six weeks coming under pressure. Um, I'm going to generally want to see it hold 39. If it doesn't, it's probably going to 37 and a half. Mm -hmm.